Okay, so we um, we are going to deconstruct the bouquet. So many of you may have seen this um, beautiful hand tie bouquet that we did um, earlier this morning, and we wanted to show you how that hand tie bouquet can be um, put into a compote arrangement. And to be sustainable and environmentally correct, um, we want to reuse these flowers, even though you may be seeing this video a couple of weeks later, but it's a really good way to reuse these flowers, um, especially, you know, bridal bouquet, if you wanted to deconstruct it and put it into a vase at home. This is a great way to do that as well. So we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna make this one a quickie. We have our beautiful compote here. We have chicken wire, so we're gonna make a chicken wire base out of it, and we're going to cut apart our hand tie and reuse all the flowers into the hand tie. So I'm gonna start with my chicken wire, um, and I need my wire cutters. Anthony, assistant. Please. No, Lauren, box yellow. That's what wire cutters look like. <laughs> I handle all the power tools in the family. <laughs> Where is my blowtorch? You, your privileges have been revoked. <laughs> so what's the chicken wire gonna do? It's gonna create our grid within the combo. Um, Doesn't it loosen the arrangement up a little bit compared to like if you were to use a foam or something like that? Um, I feel that way. I prefer chicken wire to foam, um, not for the sustainability compound because I think Oasis has come a long way and foam has come a long way with becoming biodegradable, but I like the, the artistry of the chicken wire a little bit better than the foam. <clears throat> I feel like it's not as, um, I feel like the foam kind of forces you to be a little bit stiff sometimes. It's very tight, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, there's a place for that, but. Right. Paper towel, please. Oh, great. So I'm going to go ahead and tape my chicken wire in. Um, it'll prevent the chicken wire from moving, especially when it has to be transported. Even if you feel like your chicken wire is tight in a vessel, tape it in. Just, it can't hurt to have that added assurance um, when you're traveling with something. You never know if somebody's going to stop short in front of you and it's just better to just be safe. Um, the chicken wire itself creates the grid so I don't need to go crazy with the taping. I'm just doing one across one way, one across the other way and then taping around the outside to make sure the tape stays on. That is key whenever you're taping anything is tape the outside. Anthony knows this from... And then tape to tape, right? Like tape to tape. Want to you want to get the tape over the tape. Yep. That's what it sticks to. Exactly. That's where you're, um, where it adheres best. All right, here we go. Oh no! <laughs> so I'm following the stems as I'm cutting this so that I don't cut into any stems unnecessarily. Are all those flowers going to go in that vessel? Yes. Wow. How are you doing? Because I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your first rodeo? It's not my first rodeo. <laughs> that being said, I am going to start with my greens. Uh -huh. Greens are great. You know, they're going to give you body and shape and form. You know, if you think about your garden, some of us that have, you know, home gardens, your Wait, evergreen. Can, can I cut across you real quick? Oh, you know, why, we're married. Why do you use the knife instead of uh, clippers? I use the knife personally because I, I feel that it's more efficient. I think you get a cleaner cut um, on your stems when you use a knife. Um, and you didn't start with the knife, right? I did not. I started fumbling with a pruner, not knowing what I was doing while I was sweeping floors here at the shop before I actually owned the shop. And you also, you move faster with the knife. I never put it down. Right. It's always in my hand, um, which is why I feel that it's more efficient. A lot of things to say now. Uh oh, <laughs> look who's joining us. Where's my stick? What stick? My oh, stick. your bamboo. Yeah. Uh, another thing that's been taken away along with your blowtorch. <laughs> so, so what? Uh, what greens are you using? This is leatherly fern, um, and the green that I used previously is salal tip. This is salal tip? Yes. Looks like lemon leaf. <laughs> it is lemon leaf. 
Thank you, Vika. Oh, the, the common name. <clears throat> the common for, name. For those that don't know, Big Pay yeah. Atmoy. <laughs> so you know most of this stuff in Latin. I know a good amount of it, yeah. And you had, to, you had that for both your degree in horticulture and your master's certification. More so for my degree in horticulture, but yes, my master's came in handy with my master's certification, yes, that's for sure. How many did you have to? 300. That was for horticulture? No, oh God, for horticulture, no, I can't even begin to tell you, because I had to know in horticulture, I had to know yeah. tropicals, um, you know, perennials per indigenous spot. I had to know everything, annuals. So horticulture was a bit more intense as far as that goes. And so every every flower or every plant would have a Latin name, mm -hmm. a common name. Is it a family? So they have a families, a genus, a species. What's a genus? Genus is like um, like the stock. The Mattiola is the genus. Because I call that stock. Right. So stock is the common name. Okay. So in Latin, this would be Mattiola incana. So Mattiola is the genus, and incana is the um, specific epithet. Okay. Whatever that means. Mm. The species. So there's several different types of Mattiola. So it goes big, very, very general, down to very, very specific. So the more names something has, the more specific it gets. Okay. So, uh, you know, Tomas de Bruyne has a lily named after him. It's a Gloriosa lily. The cultivar is Tomas de Bruyne. Huh. Crafty. Crafty. And it's beautiful. So where are you uh, now with this arrangement? In Bedford. <laughs> All the comedians out of work and we're all sitting here watching you. Where would you like me to be? <laughs> are I, you built are you do you base it out? I am basing it out in the greens, yes. With the greens and mm -hmm. the magnolia. And then I'm coming in with the lime flowers. Do you always do it that way or No, it really depends on, on what foliage and flowers I'm working with. Sometimes I'm not, I don't have any foliage at all. Um, and all my flowers are head to head. Um, in which case I work with the stronger stems first um, to really build my base. The hard stems. The hard, yeah, the hard, sturdy, sturdy stems. And so it's, it's irrelevant if it's a face flower or a line flower, which is going first, it's got more to do with the harder stems or the softer stems? If it's a head-to-head -head arrangement. If it's a head-to-head -head arrangement, right. then... then well, I'm you want to use line flowers in a head-to-head -head arrangement. Uh, you can. I, I wouldn't hesitate to use Mattiola in a head-to-head -head arrangement. I would just take off the top so that you have a bigger display of flowers. That would be a lot of Mattiola, right? Mm -hmm. Would you do that like as a hand tie, maybe? Yeah, it would be beautiful. In a <clears throat> bouquet, um, in anything. I think head-to-head, -head and I think of... I think of a bunch of roses stuffed into an arrangement, like that pave style. Right, that is really pave. Um, I think head-to-head -head can get really interesting. Uh, when you kind of step outside Maybe the box. Maybe we'll have to do a head-to-head -head video yeah. outside of the box. That what would you do? Fun. Depends on the season. Now. Um, if, you, if I did now, I would do peonies, roses. Um, I guess head-to-head -head wouldn't be all. In, in my head, I have one, one flower in my mind, but I'm a linear thinker. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Um, so. Yeah, I would definitely, um, I would use a variety of flowers because I think the more variety of flowers that you use, the more variety of base flowers that you use, the more interesting the overall look of head to head becomes. Same color, different colors? Same color. Really? Within a, like maybe a Tom Sertan color palette. I What's Tom I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Only a 10% variation in color. How do you measure 10% in color? Become an artist. Well. <laughs> That, oh, is that 10% or is that? I would consider that 10%. It's like 20 to me, personally. That's why I'm an Yeah, well, this is true. <laughs> How about that variation in color? That's gotta be like 90. That's, yeah, that's, I would say that's a light dark contrast. But that's an about face. That's a light dark contrast. Okay. So, when do you use contrast? You're like, when's it okay to use contrast? Because I've seen I often see like the bridges to bridge that contrast, but somehow from like this side of the arrangement to this side of the arrangement, the contrast is there, but the bridge makes it easier on the eye. Cause like I've, I've seen 
when sometimes we have like white and then just like bright colors, it just, it doesn't look good. It looks like Fruity Pebbles was like thrown on something. I think, like you're saying, contrast is okay and acceptable in almost any situation. I like the um, emotion that contrast gives you, but you have to, you have to bridge it. Um, if I have a white rose next to a pink peony and nothing in between that, all they do is fight. If you marry the two with a bridge, then it makes the contrast worthwhile. So what's a good bridge for a white rose with a pink peony? Maybe a soft pink uh, spray rose. Ah, does the size have anything to do with it? I, I think when you're bridging, um, your bridge should be exactly that, a bridge. Whereas um, if it's a peony and a rose, those are your base flowers. So your bridge should be something that's a little bit smaller and more complimentary. So I guess the spray rose would be that smaller complimentary. Mm -hmm. Bridge with something like what is this? That's Lucadendron. Um, I think you it can bridge with that. It is Lucadendron. So, I've been calling it uh, Cochia all week because I saw it on the list. Um, to your point, so everyone thinks it's Cochia, <laughs> except for Sasha. I didn't fool her. Okay. <laughs> to your point, the reason the Lucadendron is in here is because it's bridging the gap of the magnolia with that dark suede color on the back of the leaves. Because wow. that's what the Lucadendron has. That. And it sort of has like that gray in it, which I guess does that pick up on the brunia yeah. and the cochia and that sort of ties in with the the white, right? Yeah. Anything that's white? Yeah, it definitely I think it does bridge the gap of the silver quite well. Um, you finish. No. <laughs> no I think Those who can do, you are. <laughs> um, I have a really... I have a nice spread of the peonies, um, but I do have another peony that was in this hand tie, so I do want to incorporate that. So why not? I mean, who doesn't love peonies? So this arrangement could be, this, this is a great wedding centerpiece. Am I mistaken? Absolutely. Um, it's a great winter wedding centerpiece. This I would tablescape with um, like mercury glass, silver chargers, um, you know, maybe put a great top layer linen down on the table. Definitely have some candlelight all around it. I also really like, I feel like a lot of times you see like winter wedding centerpieces and stuff and it's, it's just like a lot of white and green. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the leucodendron and the silvers and then the, the magnolia leaves tie in sort of like, I guess the more natural elements at this time of year. Is that um, why you're doing it? Yeah, this to me is, this is winter to me. This is winter. Yeah, because there's, you know, when you think of like putting your feet into cozy slippers by the fireplace, they tend to be a suede or a leather or something like that. And that's what the magnolia leaf is for me. So it's cozy. Um, it's warm. Um, you say leather suede slippers by the fireplace? I don't have a pair of those. <laughs> <laughs> I tried one time and they just, they weren't for me. Well, maybe you need to ask Santa. Oh, I think my slippers do. All right. Cashmere. First. Does it exude cashmere to you? Because that's. I think of magnolia and I think I, of cashmere. I think you're right about the leather suede. That, that really is like a suede. I mm -hmm. wish the camera could touch it. Um, but my point is, my slippers are not suede. I think someone's asking for something for Christmas. No. <laughs> so, this is going to drive more nuts no. on camera. Mm -hmm. What? style would you say this arrangement is? You, it can be whatever you want it to be. Just give me a little bit of guidance here. It is symmetrical. Mm. It's symmetrical. It is symmetrical. Okay. Um, is what it makes a it mirror? symmetrical? So, good question. Is it a mirror image? Do I have the same exact number of roses on this side as I do on this side? No. But is the color, tone, and texture of it symmetrical? Yes. It's very balanced. It's very balanced. Um, and there's, there's no like, there's no like front of it, side of it, back, it's, it's... Which is why I think something like this is good for a centerpiece. Okay. Um, because you're, if you have a round table and everyone's sitting around this table, everyone has a fair view of it. Right. Um, versus, you know, if you were to do something that's a little bit more asymmetrical, you would do that on a foyer table where it doesn't have to be, you know, a 360 degree view of it. It's okay that it's a you know you can see three sides of it okay so it's symmetrical 
what kind of color palette you got there? Um, this is a light and dark contrast. So is that active or passive or? I would call it active, uh, passive. Passive? Yeah. Really? I disagree. Okay. It means nothing. <laughs> but I, I feel I like understand why you disagree because Because you're going from the white to this. Right. But style-wise, like, is it more of a traditional look? Is it more of like a boho look? I think this is a little bit more of that um, romantic, uh, Bridgerton, lush, vintagey kind of a look, especially with the mercury glass container. Romantic, Bridgerton, lush, vintagey. I would have guessed that. That's that's what I would have said. Um, which to me is... I can't believe you're that. Okay. <laughs> That's the holiday season for me. I the holiday season is classic and vintage and, you know, classic is, is following family traditions and sentiments and being together. That, that to me is what classic means. Um, and I think that's some of the emotion that something like this brings in. Um, so I could see this on my aunt's dining room table. I could too. Where is this going in our house if we, <laughs> if we bring it home? I, I would put this on our coffee table. On our coffee table? Yeah, mostly because we have this huge, enormous gray ottoman in front of the fireplace that we are constantly all around. We in front of the cards fireplace. on it, we, you know, watch TV in front of it, but sometimes Hudson's on one side, we're on another side, and so we, we use the 360 degree aspect of our ottoman. So that's why I would What put about this there. like putting these down a long table and like linking it up with bug vases and candles? And candles. Yeah. It's not too big either, right? Because like, I guess if I was sitting, I'd be somewhere around here. I could still see across it. Mm -hmm. I'm taller than most, but <laughs> I, I, I think I've got pretty good clearance on it. It took you a while to figure that out. <laughs> took you. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, um, what's the vessel called? The compote. Just a silver compote. Mm -hmm. Mercury glass. Which that mercury glass, I think, is what gives it a little bit of that vintage look. I agree. It's the finish of the glass, you know. And then it's fun how the silvers play off of the, the arrangement mm -hmm. into the mercury glass. I agree. So in your other video, you said it's not about using all the flowers, it's about achieving the vision. Here you are, finishing all the food on the plate. I had this vision before I started thinking about it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I also think is nice, um, you know, that if it were an event, you could have the same look in different styles in multiple places. Which is great. Right. I mean, wedding, you've got your bridal bouquet that translates into your centerpieces with a very cohesive look. Um, holiday party, you know, you could have this hand-tied bouquet sitting in a very shallow dish of water in your front foyer and then walk into the holiday centerpieces and have it be this. And you could have dropped that bouquet into just a tall glass vase arrangement right. just as easily. It's nice when it all ties in. Mm -hmm. um, I like it because it ties a theme throughout. I agree with you. Which is really nice. Which is fun. <clears throat> How long is this going to last? So that's the beauty of chicken wire. Um, as much as I like Oasis, like I said, um, I do think that when you have the ability to change out your water because of the chicken wire, um, your flowers are going to last that much longer. So I would give You'd this You'd have one. to tell me how to change the water on this because I wouldn't even be able to begin. I know. To this, know where to change it. It's a little tough and intimidating, but if you know that your chicken wire is taped in there, all you're doing is going over the sink and tipping the water out and then refilling it with the faucet. It makes it easy. It's so stable, those flowers aren't going to go anywhere. Okay. You um, say because so. of the chicken wire and because of the taping. Nice yeah, perfect spot for that. No, it's not my millennial flower. We, we were once told that a millennial arrangement has 
what one flower right in the middle and it's it's almost like a middle finger. Mm -hmm. So that's basically you flipping the bird. Yep. Love you. Love you.